So, welcome to Sal 1 with Bicycle Mark. This is the talk that should have been in Sal 2. Um, but we cancelled the other one because this one is better. No, that's not what I have. It's lies. If this is not the talk you're looking for, you might want to leave. Uh, there's a data recovery talk in Sal 3 right now that is also new, I was told, or something like that. But this one is better. <laughs> so, we're actually in time to start. Uh, good. Be good neighbors. Um, if people come in, give them a seat. Take out your trash and listen to the great citizen journalist, Baisal Kumar, telling about his adventures in Afghanistan. Thank you, Phil. So the, uh, the wonderful CCC, and I'm not being ironic when I say that, that they are wonderful, um, likes to put us through, you and I, through rigorous aptitude tests to make sure we're still awake. Well, that usually doesn't matter, but they like to put us through tests. So this test is, one, uh, you didn't know that I was doing this talk. That's either a good thing or a bad thing. And the other is, you didn't know it was in this room until recently. So you met that tests and you, and you passed, so congratulations on that. I seem to have passed as well because I'm in the right room for the present time. Yeah. So, uh, and everybody else is sitting in Saul too thinking I wanted to learn about Afghanistan. Um, for those who don't know me, I won't assume that you all do. Uh, they call me Bicycle Mark. You might find that not to be the most respectable name. I do all right with it. Uh, but I do have a real name. It's Mark Fonseca Rendero and I've been coming to this fine conference for five years. Uh, bringing different issues from the society track uh, with great pleasure. Often they're issues that I'm working on from home in Amsterdam or somewhere in the world. And I had the great pleasure this year of going to that oh-so-popular place called Afghanistan. You love it for its fine hills, its excellent skiing, its wonderful shopping. I know, I know. But I'm going to talk about the, uh, the less sexy part of Afghanistan, uh, which is politics. <laughs> No, uh, yes, actually, yes. So I had the pleasure, this was in September, uh, I went to Afghanistan, and I'll explain a little bit how I got there, and then we're going to get into what this thing called Ushahidi is, and then we'll get into the Afghan election. So it's kind of a, what is that, a two-parter, three-parter? You never know with me, but it should be at least three parts. Um, I also, I advanced, for those of you who've enjoyed my hijinks in the past where I'm clicking and I'm pushing things around and nothing's happening, I've moved on to a, a remote control thingy that isn't from Mac, so I can stand over here in theory and click next. Um, this should be very exciting for me, and maybe for you. So, I am a citizen reporter or a citizen journalist or whatever the media is calling me these days, or you believe that I am, that's what I am. Uh, I do research into topics that I consider underreported I do a podcast weekly for the last whew, six, seven years. My website dedicated to underreported news has been in existence for 10 years. I feel old. Um, and that's okay to feel old. I feel wise. Somebody also say they feel old? Okay. I heard you. Um, and uh, as a result of my podcast and the work that I do, lecturing a little bit on what good is citizen journalism, people invite me to weird places. Uh, I was teaching in Siberia in the last year. Um, I found myself giving workshops in Vienna. Yeah. I was impressed. They have a civilization. It's got bicycles and everything. So. A couple of years ago, I met a guy here at Republica, which is another fine conference that seems to like me sometimes. Um, and I went there to give a talk, and I met all these cool people, Peter from the Pirate Bay, good buddy now, and, and then I like to name drop. Who else can I name drop? So I met Baghdad Brian, who at that time was running um, Alive in Baghdad, the video blog. It was this, well, I don't have to get into Alive in Baghdad. It was a video blog from Baghdad uh, during the invasion. And I met Brian, and he said to me, Hey, you know, I, I know your podcast. You might have been telling the truth. Who knows? And um, he said, we should work together. And hey, I thought, I like, I like that, Brian. So if he has a thing we can work together on, I'm going. And sure enough, it took a little while. It took a few years. I always said, whatever he offered, he's, oh, I'm looking into this project. And I said, yes, put me on the list. I'm in. I'm in. And some of them were in Iraq, and those never happened, not for me anyway. And then 
couple of months ago, he said to me, what about going to Afghanistan with me? And I said, sure, I'll go to Afghanistan. I was thinking that's the last place I'm ever going to go. I'll go anywhere, but I probably won't go to Afghanistan. I mean, why would I go to Afghanistan? Do I, I mean, what business do I have there? I don't know anything. And that's the one thing, disclaimer on today, I am not an Afghanistan expert. I just spent a decent amount of time, in my opinion, there recently, and I saw some things, and I'm here to share those things with you. You yourself may be an Afghanistan expert, and that's good for you when you go to parties. Um, and I know I met them, by the way. If you go to Afghanistan, the experts, they're all in the bars. There are bars, well, bars. They're in the restaurants that serve alcohol, possibly. And, uh, and they're all trying to out Afghanistan each other. If that's you, right on. That's not me. So I end up in Afghanistan. I get a call like three days before it's time to go. Uh, I knew I might get the call. I just figured I wouldn't, because you never think you're going to get that call to go to Afghanistan. And the call comes in, and Brian says to me, am I giving away too much information? No. And he says to me, uh, can you leave in three days? And I said to him, yes. What kind of clothes do I wear? Uh, that was my first thing. I'm very into fashion. No, I just didn't want to get beat up for my clothes or anything. I don't know, t-shirts that say, you know, 26 C3 might not be good. Uh, so I didn't bring those. But uh, Brian says, no, we're going to Afghanistan. There's a parliamentary election coming up. This was September 2010 when it actually happened. We're having this conversation in mid-August. And he said, we're going to do a little monitoring uh, or we're going to work with an elections observing team or two. And I thought, or two? Okay. So. Boom, we go to Dubai, I'm going to fast forward, Dubai is crazy, that's a whole other talk. Uh, one that you've perhaps thought about giving yourself. And then, I'm in Afghanistan somehow, and I've got the right clothes, I think. And there's going to be an election, we're there three, four weeks before the election, let's see if this works. It does work. Those are just little preview photos. And um, my task was to work with an organization of international observers. You've heard of these people. Uh, you may have heard of the Carter Center, that's a popular one, Jimmy Carter, nice man, blonde, a little old, scolds world leaders a lot, very kind, like him. And I knew about the Carter Center, I knew that the European Union, the OC, -E -D -D, I can't get my letters right, but you know who they are, and they observe elections. So I knew that this exists, but I had never worked with anyone that observed elections. And here I am in Afghanistan, and I'm introduced to this team of observers. They're from all over the world, but there are a lot of Americans among them. And um, I'm told that I'm going to teach them to use Ushahidi. And my first question was, what's Ushahidi? Um, as you can tell, how highly qualified I am. And, uh, and so I spent three days before going to Afghanistan working on learning what Ushahidi is. Fantastic history. It's all available on the internet, um, which was useful. And uh, so this is, I'm really confessing a lot here. Who knew? So I ended up in Afghanistan working with this elections observation team. Now, I was working for um, a group of, well, Baghdad Brian and a couple of other all-stars from the US and questionably perhaps other countries. Um, we were all working together. I worked for the international observers. We had in our team members that were working with the local observers. There was an Afghan team. And then we still had Baghdad Brian himself, which was working, he was working some of the time with the press agency in Afghanistan. And the result was that we implemented three Ushahidi uh, maps for them. Now you might be thinking, why not just one good one as opposed to three separate ones? Well, we were not that logical thinking at that time. Um, either that or who loves re redundancy more than large organizations? So yeah, we accommodated them. Um, Small World News is the name of the team and they're a fine group of people who I've met with virtually and non-virtually over the last few years. And there's the website, in case we ever need to find them. Uh, if you can find them, maybe you can hire. No, that's okay. So, finally, we're moving on. I should check the time. Keep me regulated. Yeah, that's good. So, Ushahidi, you've probably heard of it. I would ask you to raise your hand, but I might misunderstand why you're raising your hand, or you might misunderstand what I'm asking. So, I'll just assume some of you have, and some of you haven't. You can explain it in lots of ways. So, let's, here's my way. Uh, Ushahidi to me is a, I use the word crowdsourcing first. You've heard of this. You've all crowdsourced something in your life. You probably made your own version of the bed intruder. I'm sure you did, you know. I've been watching a lot of bed intruder videos. Hide your wife, hide your kids. Um, and there are better forms of crowdsourcing than that, thankfully. Um, and the idea, of course, is that in a crowd, be it a wiki 
or another form of online project, we have a wealth of knowledge. We together can build something bigger than, than us individually. Wow, that was a backwards way of explaining what a wiki is. Anyway, um, so there's crowdsourcing in Ushahidi. There's the idea of using what I would call low tech, because an Ushahidi is an interactive map that data can come in through multiple streams. Um, one of the ways that it can come in is via SMS which was a big deal when it started in 2007 in Kenya. Um, at that time, you may remember a little bit, maybe you're too young, that'd be weird. Um, but <laughs> if you're too young to remember 2007, uh, <laughs> fuck it, you probably are. Toddlers around here, you don't remember. Get that computer out of your hand. Um, so in 2007, Kenya had an election, point a lot, and um, there was violence uh, surrounding that election. And in order to map it, they created, well, a certain group of people who I actually don't know personally, and you probably might, probably might, um, created a mapping system where people could SMS from wherever they were, uh, be it in the capital city or outside somewhere, talking about, or explain, reporting in 140 characters, for example, in an SMS, uh, what was going on in their part of the city or the country, if it was violence, they could describe the violence as best you can in that short time. And the Ushihidi system would, as it does previously, hold on, I just broke it. I broke it. Okay. Anyway, you could categorize the type of report that was coming in. So if it's police violence, boom, you put it under police violence. Uh, you see I have my categories, and if, if this laser were at all big, you could actually see that I have a little laser there. Um, there's even a category here for rape, and there are several, like if I select rape, there will be several points on the map, unfortunately. Um, and so, as you see, there could be different categories, and we could map what is going on at that time. And so they did in 2007 in Kenya. Because of the success of this map, the number of people that were sending SMS reports, or you can send email reports, uh, so the people that were doing that as well, um, it, it drew a lot of attention. People started to think, not only for mapping a crisis, which I think is the best part of Ushihidi, that you can map a crisis and, and sort of figure out what's going on and perhaps strategies to deal with it. Um, people started thinking we can use this for other purposes, and that's where sort of my work comes in. We weren't dealing with a crisis. Now, um, Afghanistan is a country... I'm a master of keynote, if you ever notice. Fantastic. How many years have I been doing this? Um, I'll explain Afghanistan in a second. In, in two minutes, I will. Um, but, so the useful things of Ushahidi, just for those who like bullet points, um, you may appreciate the fact that it's free and open source. I know we do, because our people didn't create Ushahidi, but we've built upon it, we've customized it, we're part of the community, and when I say we, I don't actually know how to do any of that, but we have people who do at Small World News. And that's the nice part. We work together as a team. I'm on the ground in Afghanistan, but I have a programmer in New York City who I can communicate with and say, this is what we need here, this is what's not working right. Uh, thankfully, because you can see what a whiz I am with technology. Um, multiple data streams um, in the context of Afghanistan. There, there are a lot of mobile phones running around, and uh, some of them may even have internet. I managed to have internet for, through a series of what I don't understand that I did. I paid a certain amount of money to the phone company, and suddenly I had, uh, I had no knowledge of what kind of limit I had, but I had some really bad broadband mobile internet on my phone, and I could tweet photos of all things, and I could technically do some internet-based stuff. So, Afghanistan had that. There's, um, there's one you press the button too hard and then everything goes bad. Okay, uh, among the things that I also like about Ushahidi, uh, and this was just a little list from their website, but I, um, you know, they say you could monitor elections, because you have elections monitors, they're watching what's going on at the polling station. And um, usually they write up a big report. Yeah, this is what's going on at polling station one. This is what's going on at polling station two. But here we could have real time, or as close to real time as possible, people sending in reports saying everything is fine at polling station two at eight o'clock. It'll go up on the map. You'll even see what time of day it came up, and we'll get to that. I'll show you my map. Um, but I actually really like the fact that they think that this will be useful for documenting a zombie invasion, because I wasn't sure what tool I was going to use when the time came. <laughs> oh, there's a better tool? She's been working on the zombie invasion. <laughs> um, so, 
Let me see if I can move on away from what Ushahidi is. And if you want a better explanation, there is the internet. Um, some of the more successful cases of Ushahidi that got rightfully so a lot of attention was again Kenya in 2008. There was a referendum to change the constitution. Um, and uh, I wasn't there. But uh, again, they used it for mapping what was going on following that referendum and during. So acts of violence, everything's okay, and all this. And so, I mean, as a journalist, I might have a correspondent in Kenya, but I could also look at their Ushahidi system and take a look at what kind of reports are coming in. Now, you may see a problem there, because maybe that this isn't the whole story, and that's a good point. Uh, but this is one useful tool, and was, for Kenya. Another case uh, besides Kenya, Haiti. I would have loved to have been a part of this, because it, it, it's very inspiring. We, we all know the Haitian uh, earthquake of 2010, and rescue workers, I would love to know more about how it all happened, but rescue workers uh, were using Ushahidi to map uh, not only aspects of what was going bad in their area of the city, but also organizing relief. So where there was food, where there wasn't, where there's clean water, where there isn't, they were sending SMSs, they were able to uh, send these. And in the end, you get this whole map laying out how the crisis looks in terms of geography. And, uh, and perhaps gives you an idea as an organization where you need to be and where you don't need to be. Um, so that was an interesting example, Haiti 2010. And th then there was someone who decided, I know about crises, I've heard maybe elections, but what about uh, crime statistics? This person wanted to test in 2009 more or less how, how it would handle if he entered a whole lot of crime information into an Ushahidi install. Um, and he ran into problems because he sort of overloaded the system with so much data and it slows down the visual part a little bit. Um, but that's a whole technical thing I shouldn't get into because I don't know how. Um, so this was used for mapping just crime statistics in Atlanta. The guy never even left his house. Okay, he might have gone out to get food. You should when you're working on this. So I already talked about how elections observing goes. I'm just going to assume you know a little about it now and I'll move forward. Um, normally, elections observing could be the boring, the what time did the polling station open, uh, what time did it close, because you want to know if it's late, if it never opened at all, if it didn't have any paper, the boring stuff. And then there's the more exciting stuff if you're in Am uh, not Amsterdam, that's exciting. But if you're in Afghanistan, there's the more exciting stuff like uh, violence at the polling station, uh, intimidation, someone carried a gun into the polling place, which you shouldn't do, No. Um, so that's all part of it, right? And normally it goes in this big report that I don't think any of us ever get to see because usually a summary is written by the organization, you know, Jimmy Carter himself. He's old, so I make this face. And uh, he's very handsome still. Don't. But, so he writes a summary and the press gets it and then they write their story based on the summary. Rarely do you get to see, I don't even think it's officially allowed, somebody should check this. Um, to actually read the raw reports from observers. But I think it should be. Uh, I would like that info. I guess that's the journalist in me. So that was the thing about using Ushahidi, which was also going to be a change. And maybe you can see where this is going. The idea was, if they allow it, these reports could go directly from the observer into Ushahidi, more or less, with me changing the category, which, you know, do I deserve that power? Um, yeah, that's what I just said, so we'll move forward. A little background on what I really enjoyed, which is getting to know this place, uh, Kabul anyway, and the outskirts of Kabul. Um, you've heard this before, but I'll confirm what I noticed while I was there. Uh, parts of the country are under government control and parts aren't. So where they don't control, there's not going to be an election. That's obvious, but that's important to keep in mind. Um, cities seem to function semi-normally. I walk the streets in Kabul without a problem, but a lot of people told me not to do that. Uh, I, um, I went to the supermarket, I, I got curious and I walked to different places. I wouldn't walk more than an hour, but I would walk for quite a while, almost an hour. And um, for me, it seemed like a city where nobody picked up the trash, but on the other hand, nobody was chasing me down the street. Uh, it was a city where I saw girls and boys going to school in the morning, happily. They were running around, laughing, pointing at me. Um, I dress well. And, and um, 
so to me, that was the functioning city part. But yes, on the other hand, you know, garbage isn't collected. There's a checkpoint every few minutes, depending on what neighborhood you're in. I know there are certain neighborhoods the, the, the government doesn't even really control. I didn't go there. Um, so I would call that a semi-functionally, semi fun, hold on, a semi-functioning city, all right? That's not an academic term, so you don't have to worry. Um, this is the second election, or was the second election since the Taliban. Uh, there was one uh, last year, or are we going back two years, last year? For, that was when Karzai got uh, so-called elected, re-elected. And there was a lot of dispute over the results, again, so this one was really important because the last one was already marred with corruption and violence. Um, there was an unbelievable amount of candidates. I think it was around 2,500 candidates. And they don't really do the party thing. I mean, I don't mean party parties. I actually went to one of those. But the, the political parties, they don't really do that. They're just individuals running. And what's really cool, by the way, is I don't know who installed the system. I think it was the International Commission for the election. Um, since a lot of people don't read, and in order to organize candidates, they gave them little icons. So there was like the two palm tree candidate. There was the one cigar candidate. And I was basically judging candidates in my spare time based on what kind of icon they had, you know. I, yeah, I really liked the one shoe candidate. Like he was, <laughs> no, he was handsome. He was handsome. Um, there were, of course, and you do hear about these in the press. Sometimes I would say more than you should, depending on what's going on. Uh, kidnappings. That was a big concern for me. If we can talk about me, um, I was definitely concerned. The first day I got there, I was supposed to go to a cafe to meet Baghdad Brian, and uh, sure enough, I get an email as I'm like putting on my coat to go out. Um, cafe. X that I was going to, uh, suspected of being the target of a kidnapping uh, uh, attack or whatever you want to call it, uh, forces wanted to take one male NGO worker, bearded, no, no, um, one male NGO worker, NGO worker one female, uh, sometime today at X Cafe. And Brian calls me and he goes, So did you get the email? And I'm like, Yeah. Where are we eating lunch? Not there. I was like, oh. <laughs> Okay, and we were there a week later because they had really good milk, milkshakes, so it was hard to... <laughs> for me, it was hard to resist once I figured it out. I thought, risk of life or good milkshake? Let's go to the cafe. Yeah. I really, after a while, I really just started thinking this way, which is probably disappointing for my mother. Um, there were, of course, bombings, suicide bombings, uh, and, and that was a fear, definitely. That's a fear at the polling place, that's a fear for a, a, an Afghan, that's a fear for me. So, that's all part of the background, and then you have, uh, of course, infrastructure that's in really bad shape. Open sewers, but, you know, there are sewers. Um, electricity goes out a lot, these are all concerns. So, well, why am I telling you about Afghanistan? Because this is the background that we're observing in an ele election, and trying to use some new technology, though low-tech. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 there was this great famous scene which embodies sort of what's up with Afghanistan sometimes. Um, they couldn't get the polling boxes, you know, where you put the ballots, I think it's called the ballot box. Uh, they couldn't get them to certain parts of the country uh, by vehicle, truck. Uh, apparently there were no helicopters available, or the areas were too remote to land the helicopter, especially in like Badakhshan and the, the mountains. So this was a great photo that's been recycled all over the news. I lifted it from Washington Post. Um, they're, you know, on donkey carrying uh, both the ballot boxes and chairs, because apparently there's a shortage of those. Um, so they're, they're going the day or a few days before the election. And I, I thought it was really amazing, actually, that they, they weren't going to be discouraged from, you know, transporting some ballot boxes, which was cool. All right, sorry to dwell on that. Oh, yeah, and in between, we did find, I feel bad for telling you all these bad things. So in between, we did fi find a golf course and we played golf. Um, and it's possible, you know, there is some joy. I was scared a little bit the whole time. There were potholes, and I asked the guy, what's that? And he's like, oh, it's landmines, but don't worry. We brought the sheep, and everything is fine now. <laughs> and you know what's weird? I honestly thought, I thought, what do the sheep do? And in my little mind, I pictured a sheep going up to where there might be a landmine and just going, <laughs> and I said to the guy, oh, they, uh, they find them. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> Um, this really happens. <laughs> I was scared. Um, but, you know, we wanted to have some fun, and it was possible. You know, certainly some authority on security probably would have, you know, just gone like, you're not supposed to be doing this, don't do this. But we played golf. Um, 
Anyway, back to the elections. So the problems with setting this up, we got there, I got there a month before the election, or a little less, and my task was to, one, oh yeah, okay. I had to train observers. I don't know if you guys know any observers. Maybe some of your relatives are observers, so pardon me if I insult them at all. Uh, there were a lot of really nice ones. But the problem was, uh, I'm trying to explain to observers who have a stressful task in a war zone, uh, and it is a war zone, um, they have a lot of work to do, paperwork to fill out and so forth. They're getting transported by armed guard. They're wearing the flak jacket which just, and a helmet. And uh, there I am going, so there's this thing called Ushahidi. Here's an Android phone. Just, when you're out there, just put in some of your reports in here. And I had these people looking at me like, what? In here? But yeah, just, so my job was to sort of get them comfortable, or at least in the few minutes I had with them, get them comfortable with the idea that in addition to the normal job, you're going to also be involved in interactive mapping. Which brought some trouble when I first said it to a group of uh, 20 or 30. Um, I don't want to do that yet. A woman uh, who's a journalist, former journalist for a newspaper I won't mention, of a country I won't mention that can sometimes be difficult, not the United States. And she said to me, she said, you're compromising our security, our safety. And I, I'm like, oh, it's an online tool. And uh, she goes, no, no, no. Our identities will be revealed, and we can never return to Afghanistan. And I'm like, whoa. You know, like, oh. and I had to think for a second, are we? Did we? And, and I looked at her and I said, no, no, no. It's, you're in a team. Your name isn't on any of these reports. It's just, what do you see, team member or team number one? Uh, you know, and I, and I thought, uh, no, ma'am, your, your name isn't in it. And she was not having it. She was like, you don't know what you're getting into. It's the internet. Our names and addresses will get out there. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and just when I was panicking and I was going to say something like, you're not that important, uh, I was about it. I was just about at your, and someone must have noticed that I was losing it briefly, and the, one of the sort of boss people who's probably watching and hating me now, uh, jumped in the way and said, listen, I've been in this business a long time. I've been where you are. I'm not putting you in safety. I'm not putting you, I mean, you in danger. I'm not putting me in danger. You know, and, and, and he cooled her down, but I, introducing this whole idea, was getting a lot of negative feedback at the risks because in their minds, a lot of their minds, the internet was a place where if you participate, Everything that you've ever written is going to get out there, including your address, and the Taliban will see it, and they'll find you exactly where you are on the map, or where you were two weeks ago, and they'll get you somehow. So, you know, I can joke about it, but it was a problem, because I wanted this woman, she's probably a great journalist, maybe, and uh, I really, I wanted her to, you know, I wanted her to be friends, and I wanted her to dig it, but she didn't. Uh, so that was a problem. Observers that don't want to change. On the other hand, many were like, this is great, and, and some said to me, this is great because now people out there are going to know what we're doing here. They're going to hear from us directly about how it's going. And a lot of people were excited at the idea that elections observers could actually have communication with the outside world. But others saw this as a great risk not worth taking. Uh, more basic problems. There are areas of Afghanistan where the mobile network goes off at night or is just turned off when there's a lot of attacks because the mobile network can be used for organizing or per perhaps carrying out certain uh, attacks. So when we went to visit, because I did, um, a lot of the Afghan mobile providers, they were like, well, you're not going to get that region, that region, and that region. And we said, okay. And then we had sort of thought about maybe doing some polling, some asking of questions to people. And the guy goes, you're going to ask people questions with their mobile phones? And I said, yeah, yeah, we're going to ask them. He's like, not controversial questions, because we cannot do that. Politically, it's a big risk. And, and I said, we're just going to ask them, did they vote last year? And he goes, too controversial. <laughs> so he scrapped the whole thing. He didn't want anyone. I was just going to ask, are you old enough to vote? Age. No, 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 no. And I was like, okay, all right, no questions at all. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, so this was a problem. I mean, I'm joking again, but it was a problem because we, we couldn't always get um, telecoms to cooperate. So we were starting to notice we may be on our own on this. Um, we may have to work out this system without the help of a telecom or without the help of the government or the government-owned telecom. Hmm. Um, the other thing is, and if you've ever managed an uh, observer mission, you might know this, the organization didn't want to allow people to just SMS where they are and it goes on a map on the internet. They wanted to be able to look at the reports first, and, and that's always been true in Ushahidi. There is someone in the seat, in the, 
entering the data that's come in and fi filing it somewhere. Um, they wanted some control because they were worried that too many reports would come from one particular area and it would all say, things are shitty here. That's not official terminology, but... And then all of a sudden on the map, for the first few hours, all you would have is violence in so-and-so region. And a journalist would go to the page, because he's going to write his report real quick, or her, and they're going to go, oh yeah, lots of violence. So the Afghanistan election sucked. Uh, and then that would be it. So he had a legitimate fear that this information, if they didn't, I don't want to say manage, I mean, any word I use here is going to be bad. Um, they were worried. So this was a problem because we couldn't, we had to run each report that came in by someone of, in charge. And that for me was a bit of a shock, but then I realized this is elections observing. It's not like writing, we don't have clean water. Um, it, it's more complicated. I said that already. How are we doing? All right. I want to make sure you guys make where you have to go next. Um, so, we had a problem with the SMSs. We couldn't get telecoms to cooperate. There was Ramadan. Um, everybody was just missing when we needed them. And when they weren't missing, we, weren't, you know, we were no longer interested. So, one of our programmers in Las Vegas, because that's a good place to program, um, he made a little Android app. Uh, I've never made one before, so pardon me for going like this. You know, a bit of caveman. And, um, and so we could put it on the Android phone, hand it to the observers, and say, look, click there, and uh, write in your report and hit send. Whew. It was uh, pretty good. So we got reports that way. We couldn't do the SMS, so we lost a lot of people that didn't have internet where they were. On the other hand, once they observed something, when they got back to their home base, their hotel, whatever it was, they should have Wi-Fi. They, we sort of made sure of that. So you could report at the end of the day. So you would lose that real-time thing, but you would have, at the end of the day, a big picture of what happened in the election. So we sort of made do with the submit form. Uh, some people used SMSs at the end of the day, um, as I said. Again, reports had to be approved by management. Uh, I call them management. It's probably not the right term. Sorry. Um, and that was a problem because it was election day, everybody's busy. And I'm sitting there getting reports from different parts of the country. Some of them are very shocking, some of them are very normal. And I'm going, what, can you, can you prove this? And they're ah, busy, busy, busy. So a lot of times we had to wait. This was a big problem for, for my experience using Ushahidi because I wanted that info to be out as soon as possible. Um, this is always a bummer, and I, I'm, I'm, ooh, I better be careful. I don't want to make jokes about this, but uh, we were working with local observers for another project, again, Ushahidi, and some of our observers were kidnapped. Uh, thankfully, which does happen, uh, it's a, big, a bit of a big Lebowski scenario, um, they kidnapped themselves, no. Um, they were freed like two days later. Uh, a lot of times people didn't want them to do their job, but they didn't want to kill them or anything. So they would just, you know, come on over here, we're going to have tea for the next two days. And, <laughs> you know, and shame on me for making, you know, poking fun, I'm not, but I was glad they were free, so I make jokes. Um, even before observers showed up, and this is the journalist in me, but I notice this all the time. I liked Twitter. A friend of mine always says, whatever happens in Kabul doesn't happen unless it happens on Twitter, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, and it's partially true. So you would get these tweets from different parts of the city. And you've heard this before with different news that you perhaps yourself have tried to spread. Um, it's early in the morning. It's election day. I'm excited or scared. And I wake up and I check Twitter, because what else do you do when you wake up? And, um, I brush my teeth and check Twitter at the same time. And um, the, one of the first reports says, uh, Rockets slam Kabul. And I'm like brushing my teeth, checking my Twitter. And I look out the window and it's like sunny and bird, well there might be, yeah, there are birds, birds singing and there's pomegranates on the tree and kids are going to school. And I thought, rockets are slamming me? I don't, so I thought, no, no, it's probably down the street. So I, I walked outside. There was no rockets anywhere. But, I mean, anywhere near me. But he, they're on Twitter, ram Kabul. You should really be specific, I'm thinking, Mr. Journalist. And then that tweet got retweeted like 20 times, and before you know it, Kabul was slammed by rockets today. <laughs> I mean, my mom must have, be wor must have been worried. Some Afghans must have been worried, like, are we being rocked by rockets? <laughs> it's redundant, by the way, rocked by rockets. So this was kind of the problem. I found that the media had already decided how it was going to go. Maybe a lot of you decided when you heard there was parliamentary elections. You decided Afghanistan, war, some people playing golf that shouldn't be. This shit's not going to go well. Um, so and that was sort of something I noticed, that a lot of the media reports were already decided. And a lot of people had decided these elections were no good, no matter what we had on Ushahidi or what happened in different neighborhoods of Kabul, which didn't have rockets. Um, 
So besides, I mean, among the bad things that happened on election day, 14 people were killed throughout the country. Um, and that, that's bad, obviously. Uh, a lot of regions, their polling stations never opened. You, when we come to the questions, you don't have to tell me these things. I know. I can't even list all the problems. Um, polling stations couldn't be opened. Some regions couldn't be gotten to. International observers often couldn't go f to a polling station for more than 15 minutes. One, because they had a busy schedule. Two, because the security thing. They had to be out of there. It's dangerous. So after 15 minutes, anything goes at a polling station, in my mind. As I'm getting this data, that's what I'm thinking, anyway. Um, but on the other hand, you naysayers, I hear you, um, on election day, a lot of people did vote. <laughs> it's important to remember that, I find. Um, there were 5.6 million votes cast, uh, 1.3 were thrown out. That's not good. It's like 20% of the votes were thrown out. But 4.3 are considered legit votes. So 4.3 million people voted. I mean, uh, you know, if we talk about the population of Afghanistan, that's not so good. But people did vote. And after being there and reading the press, I felt like people were saying the whole election was just war and everything was on fire. And I was just like, ah, it wasn't a great day, but it wasn't the worst day I've ever seen. Like, people did vote. Um, and people did submit reports based on what they saw in different polling stations. So let's go to that. Um, I'll start with the local observers, because I think they were the best. And in any situation, local people often do know their country best. They wouldn't leave the polling station in 15 minutes. They'd stay. Um, and so I know it's very small, and, and it's just too much to read on a, in a presentation, but you just take my word for it. Um, throughout the country, you, you have the reports. You have the different categories for the problems that were going on. There's a problem because they dipped their fingers in ink once they voted, and, you know, the photo in the newspaper. Um, so people, you know, there are stories of people bleaching their fingers, which I just thought was like a Michael Jackson thing, but they were apparently trying to get rid of the ink thing uh, to vote again. So, you know, that went up. You know, did, was the ink, the ink integrity was the category. So, um, other results. This is the report side. I'll show you the map side. I started backwards. Um, these are when you actually click on the map, you can actually get a, a, a report. This is the list of reports that we got. Uh, we got si uh, 363 reports from about 40 observers uh, in one day. Uh, oh no, we got a few, a few days before. We had long-term observers. Um, the map itself looks like this. I'm not impressed with it, to be honest. I think, you know, I would have wanted better. Okay, I broke it. Hold on. Come here, map. Yeah. So that's our, our map. And I know, you know, it doesn't look very exciting. We didn't have time to add the exciting graphics. Um, we could have, by the way, when you use these things, you can do it on OpenStreetMap, you can do it on Google Maps, you could, there's any number of maps you can overlay. Uh, I wasn't really in charge of that part, so I can't say much about it. Um, but you obviously want um, a good and usable map. Um, so that's our map in the end. Yeah, I'll, I'll hear about it from you at the end. One more thing that we did. We had a group of reporters, and this was probably the best part, actually. It was the Afghan press agency. Um, we had been sort of giving them help, advice, uh, little workshops on how to edit video on the fly, how to do things in sort of low-tech journalism. And um, we also told them, here are some Android phones. Um, write some reports on election day from wherever you are. And thankfully, they were all over the country. And so we ended up with an Ushahidi map. Whoa, look at that, I ended the show. Um, we, don't worry, I know how to handle this situation. We ended up on an Ushahidi map uh, with about another 50 or 60 reports from all over the country, and it had some of the most interesting reporting because those people were in places that even um, election observers weren't allowed to go to. So I actually really enjoyed it. It's at uh, Alive in Afghanistan, aliveinafghanistan.org. Um, and I did bring that, but who knows if it'll load now. So, I'll just give you some conclusions and then we're done. Oh yeah, that was the map. So, I mean, there are regions of the country. Kandahar down here is a very difficult place and you only get seven reports uh, out of there. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm not going to start pointing to the map. You can see it. I'll put my notes online. So, lessons learned. Um, if you want, this is if you want real-time reports coming from elections observers. Um, the middleman does ruin things. I mean, me sitting there, you know, besides the fact that I left to play golf one day, I'm sorry, 
but uh, me sitting there inputting data that you already sent to put it on the map but waiting for approval, it slows down the whole process. That and somebody deciding whether or not your report is good enough or bad enough slows down the process and perhaps takes away from the actual content. I mean, it's not the direct to the web dream that some of us may have had. I broke it again. No, I, all right. The other thing is, and I said this before, but it's a good conclusion, you can't rely on government. Um, you know, the government obviously didn't know who the hell we were. They knew the observers, but we were just a little project within the bigger project. We couldn't rely on telecoms. They had too many fears of politics, of attacks. They had legitimate fears, too. Um, so we kind of had to do it ourselves. Now, some people would use a little SMS gateway. Uh, I think they did that for actually Alive in Baghdad. Wasn't part of it. Um, but so we had to kind of figure it out ourselves. And the internet-based aspect helped because we didn't need the government's permission to do that. We didn't need a telecom's permission to do that. Um, yes, yes. Oh yeah, I would have loved to have spent more time training observers, including that lady who thought that I was risking her life by putting stuff on the internet. Um, so in the future, I would really enjoy that. I would say that elections observing, it's early, but I would say that election observing is not Ushahidi's strength, and the creators of Ushahidi would argue that, and they're smarter than me, so maybe you want to listen to them, but um, I think that for a crisis, people are sending in reports because they want to fix the crisis. If it's an earthquake, there's not too many people that are going to go, stop fixing stuff, stop feeding people. It's not going to happen. So people are going to send in reports saying, we need water here, we don't need water here. That's not very political. I know it can be, but it's not. In an election situation, you have people who don't want the election to look a certain way. You have people who don't want their party to look a certain way. There's a lot more room for people sending in bad reports. Now, elections observers, we trust more, but that depends on how well trained they are. So I would say, I'm sure it has a future and people are going to try it. I'll probably try it again. But I would say elections observing is not Ushahidi's strength. I much prefer it for a crisis situation. I'm interested in it for mapping like just raw data, like crime statistics, but in a war zone and in a place where everything is so political and so manipulated and can be, I would say that Ushahidi is not the best solution. Crowdsourcing, you need to be a crowd that is not under threat of death or bombing in order to perhaps observe something and report it. I mean, it's much harder in the circumstances that Afghanistan has. Anyway, it was an interesting project. I had a great time. I have to finish now. And so, this was one of my, well, one of my last days. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to end on that note with that in the background, because, uh, in fact, it's a, such a beautiful country. And I know people say that all the time when they want to, you know, get you to support it or whatever. But, um, you yeah, know, I, I felt a great kinship with the place. I was glad to be able to work on an election. We had this guy at the hotel. Uh, every night I would come in and say, like, hey, how you doing? We would sit, we would chat. And he was teaching me things about the country. And uh, he said to me, like, thanks for what you're doing here. And I said, I might be some doing something useless here. How do you know? And he goes, I know. You're doing something good for Afghanistan. And I said, well, OK. He's like, yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. And I just thought, like, how does he know I'm doing something good? And so every day we would go on the, well, not every day, but we would go on the roof and there were kids flying kites and you could always just go up and watch kids fly kites. And they would look at you kind of like, what are you doing here? We're flying kites. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's that. I highly recommend uh, helping or doing work in uh, Kabul. It's one of the great places I've ever been in my life. And uh, thank you. And if you want to find me, there it is. Thank you, Mark. His website is citizenreporter.org. Yeah. There's a podcast, blog, video features. Yeah. I put it stuff there secretly. from Afghanistan. Interesting things. So before questions, um, we, I want to talk to the internets. The internets. We have a mission angel, and um, she's called Claudia, and she has questions from the internets. Dear real life people, we have microphones. Um, yeah, questions. Uh, you mentioned a couple times the difficulties of having middlemen entering the, the results. And I'm wondering um, what you would think of the 
potential for overrepresenting problems if you had individuals like just reporting constantly doing it themselves? One of the problems was that I don't know, you know, elections observers, have you ever done it? No. Um, they're all so different, you know, people. They're all so different. And so some of them were the type that would write, and I've seen all this, so I can talk about it, probably not legal. Um, they would write, like, guy walked into polling station with a gun. And that's, we know that's not allowed. So you don't have to say, that's not allowed, what a jerk. You know, you don't have to say that. But then there were people who would write, candidate showed up at polling station and was talking to people campaigning, which is illegal, but that's what he's known for, and la 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 la. And then you would write this whole paragraph, journalist style, about what's wrong at the polling station. And so the problem is that maybe that's with training, and I'm not accusing anyone that I worked for for not training well, because they worked hard. But if you could get a set of elections observers to really follow the, these set of rules, set of guidelines, and report a certain way, which is hard, then I would have more faith in someone having direct access to direct, you know, reports. If you trust a group of people enough, and if you, you're on the same page with them, then I think you could get a pretty good map. I, I don't know, did I, am I on with what you're asking or no? Uh, you are, I think, you know, there's, there's trade-offs to both approaches. I was just curious what you thought about that. Yeah, I, I would be interested in trying it, but then again, I'm not in the world of politics and funding and all that stuff. Maybe I should be, but I'm not. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Mm. What's that? I have two questions from the IRC channel. One question is uh, uh, from uh, Maryland and Hackerspace and also from here. And they stated like uh, 1,3 million is an awful lot uh, invalid votes. Do you know what exactly was going on there? Were people deliberately, deliberately casting invalid votes out of protest or something? Um, it's a whole mixed bag. Um, you can read about it. It's, it's, they tried to document it well. There's invalid votes from people that were assumed to have voted more than once about that whole ink problem. Uh, there were places, you know, everybody talks about election day going perfectly, but one of the things I heard a lot about through back channel chat, you like that term, back channel? Um, people the day after the, the, the voting, the ballot boxes, went to places to be kept for a little while in police stations, which is not supposed to happen. The police are not to be trusted. Um, well, they're new, I'm just saying. So um, the days following, a lot of ballots were tampered with, and when that, those, um, they're not rumors, when those stories were confirmed, a lot of those ballots were thrown out as invalid as well. So it's like a whole mix. It's not just of people who, who shouldn't have been voting, that voted twice, but it was also what happened to the ballots in the days after where they ended up, where they were, uh, well, they, 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 something may have happened to them, so they're thrown out. Um, and we also have stories and reports that came in, you can read them on Ushahidi, all three of them, um, that uh, ballots were being stuffed in some areas. People came in with just a, a fistful of ballots, sounds like a punk song, and they just crammed them in the box. Uh, yeah. But the, were there protest uh, votes also, like protest organized votes? protests? Uh, people uh, voting twice as, as a protest against the election or something? Not, like not that, that I, I mean, I, I, the, not in mass. As a protest? I don't, I don't think so. There were protests. And I was there during the Koran burning threat. And if you ever want to disrupt everybody's life, Afghans and foreign, uh, threaten to burn a Koran. Um, so uh, there were tons of protests at that time, the same time as the election. And then there were protests that weren't about the Koran, but they were about corruption. Um, but protest votes, it's possible, but not on a scale that, that got recorded. Uh, the other question is uh, if... Uh, you Shahidi is like a Vicky for news coverage. How do you avoid that the admins behave like the ones from Wikipedia, like abuse powers? Yeah, well, that's one of the problems. Um, in a way, you get a little bit back to the world of, or Wiki, well, not Wikipedia, I guess, because they have so many editors, but yeah, do you trust that person? Do you trust me? You know, I, I didn't have the authority to approve or disapprove, but I was getting them. Do you trust me, if you gave me that power, to approve or disapprove? Uh, I don't have an answer to that question. You have to train somebody well. You have to see their record, maybe. They have to prove themselves as good, just like on a blog, like someone who writes a blog. If they prove themselves over time, maybe then you trust them. But maybe that's the time they have a meltdown, or maybe they're spies. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, as long as there's that middleman, you've got to put some faith into that person. So. 
Um, you mentioned at the start of the of your talk um, in describing Ushahidi that it's a crowd that crowdsourcing is a big thing that it does, and I know it's sort of early in the days of crowdsourcing, and it's sometimes hard to have a, a definition of it. But my understanding, and I think a lot of people's, is that crowdsourced journalism is when citizens who are not trained journalists report in. Uh, and that was especially what happened during the, the Kenya um, elections and certainly during the um, other uses of Ushahidi. And so I thought it was interesting that your issue was that you had people who were highly trained, like these observers and the journalists, and you were calling that crowdsourcing. And I wondered if you could maybe just talk a little bit more about that. Well, that, that's where Ushahidi's could get weird, depending on what people want to do. Because in the end, it wasn't our idea, I'm like get, get, getting rid of blame, but it wasn't our idea to do this for elections observers. It was the election observer organization that said, let's do something new. And I give them credit for it. Let's do something innovative. And one of their guys said, you know, there's this thing called Ushahidi, and here's what it did in Kenya. And they said, well, maybe we could just have it for just elections observers. So now we're creating something that wasn't, it wasn't originally meant for this audience nor for, for this controlled, you know, so it's a different environment and, and that's part of the problem. But at the same time, that could also be interesting because at least then you know that it's not being manipulated because that's the weird part about the Kenya maps. I mean, in Haiti, I don't think anybody, again, was going, let's lie about where there's dirty water. I hope not. Actually, apparently one of the big things they dealt with was they got a lot of spam. Spam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, not only are you got to be worried about spam, you got to be worried about you know, false reports, people with a vendetta against somebody. Um, sorry, did I get lost? No. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. But there's no good answer for it. That's the problem. Okay. Looks like we're done. All right. Thanks, um, Finn. Thank you, Mark. See you next time.